Um, well, anyway, welcome to our fourth annual symposium sponsored by the Berkeley Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. Many of you know that this center is really the nucleating center for research on campus. And it, I'm the co-director along with Tom Alber. And this uh, center started pretty much organically on campus when we realized, we, we let Jeff Owen, the former dean, realized that there were people all over campus whose research had impact on global health. And we were really, really lucky to receive a generous gift from Sam Wheeler, who's here today. Thank you, Sam, for coming. Um, that, us, that allows us to build the center and to continue to grow. And it's been a really fantastic year. We, we support research and training on campus and beyond. And with regard to training, we really care about bringing students here from developing countries and our students go, have been in Africa. A current student is in India right now working on tuberculosis vaccine research, Central America and South America. And I think there's been an obvious interest from many of our students. We've also this year initiated a Bay Area India tuberculosis initiative where investigators from Berkeley, Stanford, UCSF, collaborate with a group with groups in India especially in Delhi and that's going very well this year also uh, we have a floor in the new building of infectious disease floor in Li Kaxing building that's um, they're moving in in about a month we have investigators on that floor from three different colleges School of Public Health College of Natural Resources and MCB so that's pretty exciting and we have a, a search going on now for another colleague and working in the area of infectious disease and global health so anyway, this has been a, a really, I think we're in log phase about now. <laughs> anyway, so I'm not going to make long introductions today. You have the bios of all the speakers. In fact, I'm just going to try to crystallize in a couple sentences who these speakers are and why they're here. So our first speaker today is Stanley Falco, Professor Emeritus at Stanford. For those of you who aren't familiar with Stan's contributions, They've been, we're now in our sixth <laughs> decade. I like to say he's the father of the molecular approaches to bacterial pathogenesis, but I think grandfather, sorry, Stan, is probably more appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the new father. <laughs> um, anyway, Stan's been making contributions, so many contributions, I, I, I could barely start to scratch the surface. Um, but the, the bottom line is, is that using very modern approaches from, for, he, he has made so many seminal contributions. And importantly, maybe mo the most importantly, he's put out over 100 different, you know, of his students and postdocs um, who have gone on and have faculty positions all over the country. And one thing that's amazing, of these 100 or so people, pretty much every single one stay in the field of bacterial pathogenesis. There's only, I can't even think of any exceptions. Um, so that's, I think, once you've got that bug, so to speak, um, you're never going to leave. Anyway, and uh, obviously a lot of you are interested in as well, which is nice. So anyway, without further ado, Thank you. Stan Falco. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, I was going to tell him to save it for the obituary, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, uh, we can defer. Uh, I wanted, uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here uh, with you, and the, uh, the title is, was probably not in, the, uh, in, in your uh, folder, but uh, this, is, this is what I'm going to talk about today, is about the uh, non-typhoid salmonella in Africa. So uh, I wanted to begin, however, uh, since I retired, I've been, I teach a course called The Impact of Infectious Disease on, on, on History, and uh, I'm going to do this, I think. Okay. And uh, I became familiar with the anthropological literature. And this is something that comes from an old textbook in anthropology. And it shows uh, purportedly the peaks are the peaks of population and humanity over time uh, versus uh, what different historical events. And uh, what you can see uh, in this is that you have lots of plagues and wars 
that occur at the peak of population. Then there's the decrease, a massive decrease in population in humanity. And that's always followed by a renaissance. And uh, this ended uh, here at around World War II, when this, uh, uh, right after World War II. There's not a renaissance in sight, but the population is still increasing. So we'll see. But uh, the fact is that because of the strides that were made in the, in the uh, 19th century, uh, because of Koch, Pasteur, Lister, and their, their students and their followers. Of course, there was a marked decrease in, in, in the rate of death, and because it was understood uh, for the first time that disease was not the result of a curse of some witch or bad air, but rather microorganisms. And uh, this, the, this was a remarkable uh, chapter in, in history, and the discovery of antibiotics uh, even was more so, since it, it reduced uh, the, uh, the deaths declined by 220 per 100,000 in a 15-year period after their introduction in medicine and turned medicine into something that was mostly diagnostic to something that was therapeutic. It was a remarkable time. And uh, in parallel, of course, there were the vaccines. Uh, this, uh, and you can't read this, of course, but this just shows the accumulation of, of effective vaccines over time. And indeed, if you look at the impact, uh, global impact of immunization and the decrease uh, in, in cases and death, it's, it's quite extraordinary what's happened. So we have been blessed really by medical technology, at least in the more technologically advanced countries of the world. But uh, as you know, if you're at this symposium today and, and you studied it all, that in the rest of the world, most of the world, the other 99%, I guess, is, uh, is uh, it's, the children are still, if you look, I've underlined the infectious uh, diseases here. This is uh, over the ages of, uh, from the less than a year old to uh, around 19 years of age. And when you look at what is killing, it's still diarrhea, uh, uh, acute respiratory tract diseases, pneumonia. Even when you get down, you see things like tetanus, and whooping cough, preventable diseases that are still uh, killing so many young people in the world. And you, and you go through the rest of these things, and aside from traffic accidents and suicide and the like, and violence, which is inevitable, you still see that pneumonia, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and so on. But diarrhea is, is still there, meningitis, and so on. So we still have a something. Uh, in front of us that we have to conquer uh, to be successful. And it is not as if we are just conquering diseases that exist, but there are new diseases that are constantly appearing. So if you uh, look, for example, now at the continuing evolution, uh, we now have a global village because we have things like airplanes that, that, that carry us around. We have enormous amounts of antibiotic resistance, and I will uh, talk to you in a little bit about how Antibiotics have played such an incredible role in the evolution of this new salmonella in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I know as well as anybody about age-related degeneration. And uh, an emerging disease is, uh, is very often some new diseases, but also old ones that have been given a new opportunity because of human uh, so-called progress. And we keep providing old microbes with new opportunities. And uh, again, I'll speak a little bit about that. But what I want to talk about today primarily is uh, this. And it's not particularly well known in the United States, I, I, I fear, but it is known in, in Africa. And in, in, for the last 20 years or so, there's been an emergence in, of non-typhoidal salmonella, uh, salmonella typhimurium, something we associate with food poisoning, as a major cause of pediatric bacteremia. And it has a mortality rate of, give or take, even with treatment, of roughly uh, 20 to 25 percent. It's quite a lethal disease, and it's a leading cause of sepsis. And it appeared at different times throughout Africa. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, and, but uh, I want to give to, I'm going to take this in steps, if you will. So first, I want to talk about the ground, the ground rules of microbial host interactions, just in case uh, you're 
not familiar with. So uh, we have in us organisms that are just passing through uh, after a salad. We have commensals that are with us from basically the time we're born till we die, and then they consume us. But uh, commensals are, eat from the same table, and everyone talks about the human microbiota now. It's, uh, it's a really growth industry, as it, as it were. And, uh, and then there are the pathogens, which comes from the Greek meaning of pain. And they, could, they can be commensals, but they're notable because they regularly cause disease in apparently normal people. Opportunistic pathogens are those that cause disease only in human hosts that are some way uh, compromised. And that's what you see in many hospitals. Uh, you have accidental pathogens, uh, things like, uh, in a way, rabies and so on. And then you have accidents of host susceptibility, where you have uh, uh, not so much that the organism uh, that is mating is so pathogenic, but the, the host that somehow has a susceptibility. We're going to talk a little bit about that at the end, about the host factors that may be involved in disease. Okay. Now, in medicine, there is no clear distinction between uh, uh, what a pathogen is. It's very simple. It's any organism that can cause disease. That's, and, and you have to do that if you're a physician. But uh, good medicine is not necessarily good biology in, in some cases, because uh, disease, uh, forgive me, is, can be a distraction from understanding the biology. So, What's the difference between a pathogen and a commensal, then, in a biological sense? And uh, I think, let me just do this. OK. So uh, pathogens, this works. Pathogens possess the inherent ability to cross atomic barriers and breach other defenses that limit other microbes and commensals. So it has the ability to go to a particularly unique niche. Most pathogens, therefore, can establish themselves in a place that is usually devoid of stable microbial populations. And these properties are essential for their survival in nature, that is, the microbes, and they are often host-specific. So that's how I view pathogens. Now, you don't have to agree with me, and if, and if you don't, I understand and I don't care. But it's, I find it the easiest way for me to, to work, so you'll have to forgive me if I, if I step on you in that sense. So, uh, so in the classic sense, we talk about virulence factors. Uh, these are the thing, properties that give the organism the ability to cause disease, and these are things that let them persist within a host or even invade. And we now understand these in, in molecular terms and what happens, and we understand the vulnerability of some of the host defenses is the key to whether or not a, a microbe is or is not pathogenic for a host. And so, but the factors used by microorganisms to overcome a specific host defense strategy is critically important, and that's what defines a, a, a factor, a, a virulence factor. But uh, you only understand microbial virulence in the context of the host. To study just the organism and not the host and think you understand the interaction is, is kind of now foolishness. There used to be an excuse for this <laughs> when we didn't know very much about the host, but now th think, of it. I mean, think how, how privileged you are to be able to be in a generation where you have the complete genomic sequence of the host and of the invading organism for the first time. Now all you need are the ideas <laughs> to make it work. So, so I want to then, so it, it's very clear in some bacteria that the distribution of pathogenicity is variable, and in the enterics, that's true. So a few E. coli are virulent, Shigella is virulent, Salmonella are virulent, but many other genera within the same family of bacteria are not pathogenic. So the issue is, why is Salmonella pathogenic? So I'm going to step through that, if I can. And uh, so, Salmonella uh, is a, uh, a well-known organism that causes gastroenteritis and typhoid. And what I'm going to tell you, it's a, it's a, a re-emerging infection exhibiting new properties. 
in the developing world. Now, classically, salmonella was uh, actually identified by Theobald Smith and a man named Salmon. People always say to me, why do you, you don't pronounce salmonella correctly? They always say, you know, you say salmonella and not salmonella. Well, his name was Salmon. It wasn't Salmon. And that's why I call it Salmonella. <laughs> so. so anyway, using classic biochemical and serologic uh, tests, in, in the laboratory, uh, they identified something like 2,500 different kinds of Salmonella. And they were always given the names of where they were isolated and so on and so forth. Uh, however, using DNA hybridizations, it was found that about 85% of all the Salmonella serotypes were basically the same organism. So uh, there came then a method to uh, characterize these in which we had uh, Salmonella uh, was divided into a ver various subspecies. And one called Salmonella enterica enterica, found only in warm-blooded animals and birds, is, makes up most of the things that are important in, in human medicine. And so we still use the old serotypic names for convenience. So there's Salmonella enterica typhimurum, Salmonella enterica typhi. The most fascinating thing to me, in many ways, is the fact that Salmonella are very often host adapted, so that Salmonella typhi is strictly found only in humans, while a very closely related group of organisms, Salmonella gallinarum pylorum, only infect poultry. And I spent some part of my life trying to convert Salmonella pylorum into typhi with great failure, I might add. And I, I think I now understand why it failed. And Salmonella typhi murium, while it causes host adap adapted disease in, in mice, uh, causes mainly gastroenteritis in people. But as I'll tell you, that's now changed in Africa. So now Salmonella infection in humans is fairly straightforward. So Salmonella typhi murium and enteritidis are zoonotic diseases. They are acquired from animals. They go into people. They give a self-limiting disease. And it's not transmitted from person to person. This is classic. Typhi is, is, not, trans, is not transmissible from humans to animals. It's only among people. And, uh, and, so, and it's anthro, what do they call it? Anth Anthropon it's an anthroponosis. So just quickly, in the world, about 2.2 million people die of foodborne illness. That's non-typhoidal disease. Uh, in industrialized countries, we, about one in three of you have had food poisoning this year of some kind. So I don't know how many of you, but think about when you vomited or had diarrhea, it was very likely food poisoning. And, uh, there's a, a, a quite a new number of cases and, and, and uh, a few deaths. And if you look at this, it's, uh, it's quite striking over a period. This is from 2000 to 2007. And uh, without trying to read it, it's, uh, uh, you have to understand that many of the organisms involved are now multi-drug resistant. Fortunately, most of the time, you don't have to treat salmonella food poisoning because it's self-limiting. But it's, uh, uh, the risk factors involved uh, tell you something. Traveling outside the United States uh, gives you a very high risk factor of getting foodborne disease. Eating a fried egg prepared outside the home gives you a very high probability, or a higher probability of getting the disease. And the thing that's very interesting, if you've had an antibiotic, and this is ampicillin, chloramphenicol, aminoglycosides, and sulfonum, a tetracycline group, during four weeks preceding the onset of illness, there's a high probability, a higher probability that you will get the disease. And that's not because it's a resistant organism. It's because the disruption of the normal flora by an antibiotic removes the protective uh, effects of the normal flora, and you're more susceptible to disease. So, so uh, I always like this. Uh, any person with symptoms of diarrhea is prohibited from swimming at this time. I don't know what time is prohibited. It's not, but. <laughs> This says, excuse me, from, uh, uh, because being late, because I have explosive diarrhea. And this is a goldfish with diarrhea. The, the, important, points, the important point here is that, that salmonella food poisoning is short incubation. 
It's self-limiting, and there is no carrier state. It's by an organism infecting a human that is not adapted to the host, and it's quickly disposed of. Uh, uh, the foods, there are all kinds of foods now that you can have that uh, are with salmonella because there is basically a manure glut in the world, and there are feces everywhere. The world is a fine patina of feces, and it gets into your food. This, however, is an opportunity for new foods uh, that you can have. <laughs> and, FDA approved. So typhoid, on the other hand, is disease that is found globally, and, uh, 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 but pretty well absent from a lot of the world, uh, Europe and the United States. But it's found, and especially uh, still heavy, in uh, the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia. But there's still 16 million cases a year, about 600,000 deaths. It is human to human, fecal oral, uh, through contaminated food. The fatality rate is about a third if uh, untreated and less than 1% with treatment, although resistance is, is rapidly uh, uh, appearing uh, in, in the world. So, now, instead of having a short-acting disease, this is a disease with a very long incubation period that measures in weeks. Uh, it, uh, the organism is replicating. It uh, goes from a local place in the, usually the mesenteric lymph nodes, and appears in the bloodstream and spreads to the liver and spleen. Uh, it's uh, usually seen clinically when it appears in the bloodstream at about two weeks after exposure. It can be found in the urine and feces. And over time, it, uh, antibody comes up. The disease begins to be uh, controlled unless you interfere with antibiotics. And uh, what is uh, cl critical about typhi is that in a small subset of patients, they will go on to be colonized and will be carriers for the rest of their life or for very long periods of time, and they are the reservoir for infection. So on the one hand, you have Salmonella typhimurium gastroenteritis, which is short-acting and self-limiting, and you have typhoid, which is a host-adapted disease that's more systemic. In seroprevalence, if you go in a place where Salmonella typhi is endemic, you will find that for every clinical case, there are probably eight cases that, are, that were, were subclinical or asymptomatic. Okay. Uh, we did some studies a few years ago looking at the peripheral blood uh, uh, transcriptome in patients with and without typhi, and this is what you see at the end of a month. And you don't, uh, all you have to know is that uh, green is down regulated, red is up regulated, but you can see that there's totally different transcriptional profiles in people who had typhoid versus those who didn't, and this is largely in inflammatory uh, genes. Uh, what was remarkable about this study was that at the end of six months, the people who had typhoid still had aberrant transcriptions in their, in their blood, meaning that this, is, that this disease has an impact over a period of time far beyond what one would have seen. These people are asymptomatic. They were treated with antibiotics. They're well. But they are still showing signs uh, in their immune cells of, of things. And if you look at this over a period of time, uh, what you find is that the people who are infected at, the, at, at 28 uh, begin to move more and more towards being normal. But there were four here in black who never lost their transcriptional profile. And these are the people who became the carriers of the disease. So, uh, Th this is how, uh, uh, kind of a, stop, a snapshot of the normal thing. So, so the, one of the, the, the major issues of typhoid is the fact that there is a carrier state that is asymptomatic, and these are the people who are the reservoir. So to summarize this, in uh, Salmonella typhimurium disease, the organism enters uh, into a unique spot in the, in, in, in the, the body and you get a self-limiting infection that is controlled locally, while in typhoid you have uh, basically the same method of entry, but the organism has adapted itself to the host well enough that it becomes disseminated, and in many cases it's asymptomatic, and in many cases it leads to a carrier state. So the basis for pathogenicity uh, is uh, done by uh, sequencing, and we now have the complete sequence of Salmonella typhi Miriam, Salmonella typhi, about uh, 20 of the serotypes, uh, and 
The story, as many of you will now know, sorry, go back, is that the pathogenic bacteria, now we now know that many, very often, pathogenic bacteria are pathogenic because they have clusters of genes on discrete islands called pathogenicity islands that are present that are not present in related non-pathogenic bacteria. And that these genes were acquired by lateral gene transfer. So all the things you learned in biology about bacteria mating and having a mobile gene pool is true. And that one of the things that occurs is the inheritance of groups of genes that let organisms now adapt in a specific way to hosts. And we call those virulence genes. Uh, and we can recognize these genes, and the amount of DNA in many cases is substantial. So in salmonella, as compared to E. coli, they have a very uh, similar chromosomes with similar organization. But scattered in the salmonella chromosome are insertions of DNA, often containing 50, 60, and more genes uh, that are involved in pathogenicity. In some cases, the ability to enter cells. And in some cases, uh, the ability to survive within macrophages, and in some cases, to be shed. So uh, the capacity then for salmonella to enter and replicate is an associated with one pathogenicity island. Uh, they enter uh, the cells by going through uh, the Peyer's patch in a specialized group of cells called the M cells, uh, which uh, you can appreciate here. Uh, where you have in the small bowel, you have these specialized cells, salmonella entering, and underneath are immune cells, which ordinarily are there to phagocytize an entering or foreign organism, uh, digest it, process the antigens in a way that are, uh, so that it, they become, uh, you get an immune response. However, salmonella takes these cells, and rather than being phagocytized and killed, in some cases, is phagocytized and continues to exist. So uh, the SPI-1 island it, it does this, and it lets the organism synthesize a little hypodermic syringe that it uses to poke a hole in the host cell, secrete proteins in the bacterium into the host cell. It causes the host cell to react in a way that the bacterium is, is actually engulfed and brought into the cell, and once inside, it uh, can replicate and, in fact, will kill the cell. Uh, uh, so whether it's typhoid or whether or not it's Salmonella typhimurium, they come in and they uh, encounter the innate immune system uh, and go through toll factors and, uh, uh, and nod factors. And in fact, uh, this leads to a reaction by the host cell uh, so that it secretes IL-1 and IL-18 and, in fact, will usually clear the infection. That's what happens in gastroenteritis. And it happens initially in typhoid. However, host-adapted salmonella also have another pathogenicity island that lets them live within a macrophage or a phagocyte. And on that basis, they can live. And not only can they live, they can occasionally find a specialized host cell where they are not killed, and the host cell isn't killed, but they can replicate. The nature of this isn't known, but it appears to be an altered form of the macrophage, an alternately activated macrophage group that are more non-inflammatory. And it's there that they replicate, and it's these cells are those that carry them to the systemic sites of the liver and spleen and lymph nodes. And then over time, and we can replicate this in a mouse model, Denise Monac and I did some years ago, uh, you can now, instead of having a dead mouse, most of the mice, uh, uh, or, and people in that case, will, will carry these organisms over a very long period of time. These animals were kept for 60 days because it became a trade-off of how far could you follow it out and how much could you pay the animal costs. But in some cases, you can follow for well over a year you will find that the animals are still infected. Even in the presence of perfectly good antibody that in a test tube will neutralize the organism. So it's not that the host doesn't see the organism or respond, both in the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system, it's that the organism can escape. So, 
uh, period of time, you can also see that after 60 days, the liver, spleen, uh, mesenteric lymph node uh, still have good, good numbers of bacteria, and there's still carriage in the, uh, in the intestinal tract. So, so, so what's the genetic differences now? Well, it looks like the evolution was that there was a common ancestor that gave rise to E. coli in Salmonella. The Salmonella first got a spy one pathogenicity island and learned how to invade the Pyre's patch. So it went from the colon to the small bowel to a specialized set of cells, and it went in there. It then learned how to live inside macrophages, and it then got a plasmid. And I didn't point this out to you, but typhimurium and typhoid differ in a very particular way, and that is the typhoid has a capsule called the VI, and typhimurium does not. But typhimurium has a plasmid called the virulence plasmid that typhi doesn't have. Those are the two major genetic differences that one sees. But uh, so this appears to be what occurred in getting to Salmonella enterica. But it doesn't explain, since host-adapted bacteria have it and non-host-adapted bacteria have it, what is the basis for host adaptation. Okay. So if you look at now the Typhi versus Typhimurium chromosome, what you find is something that's very striking, and that is in Typhi, as compared to Typhimurium and E. coli, that you find that there are lots of deletions in pseudogenes. These pseudogenes are genes where the sequence is there, but they're not functional. And uh, to make a very long story short, every time you look at a host-adapted strain, versus a non-host adapted strain, or, or use E. coli as a gold standard, the host adapted strains have pseudo deletions and deletions. So in order to adapt to a host, it appears that you have to get rid of some genes instead of others. And that works, at least in the salmonella, remarkably well. And uh, you can find out that there are certain genes for shedding and a different kind of capsule than the uh, than the VI that typhoid got rid of. So typhoid got rid of all these genes. There are 12 different genes for fimbria. Fimbria are these little proteinaceous things that stick on the surface of cells and let them, uh, and, and so that they can stick. Uh, Typhimurium has 12. Typhi got rid of 11 of them and kept one, and so on. So it's an adaptation. So the loss of genes, then, is the hallmark of host restriction. So how does evolution deal with dogma? So this, this is a statement that states many grant applications of things. Samuel typhimurium is the cause of self-limiting gastroritis in humans, whereas typhi is responsible for systemic disease uh, seen only in primates. And I've been telling you that now for, for 20 minutes. Okay. But now we're going to come back. Here's Africa. We have the appearance of sepsis and long-term disease in, caused by Salmonella typhimurium. It's invasive Salmonella typhimurium. And it is extraordinary because the, uh, it is the leading cause of sepsis. Usually, it's things like the pneumococcus, staphylococci, so on. No. In sub-Saharan Africa, in pediatric cases, the leading cause of bacterial infection of the bloodstream is Salmonella typhimurium. Rob Kingsley, who was at the Sanger Center, did some uh, multi-locus typing. And he found that the two, there were two clades of Salmonella typhimurium that very distinct from the usual laboratory strains and the classic foodborne strains that cause the disease. And in fact, when you look at them, they are not at all associated with foodborne Salmonella. They form two distinct clades. These are red. So 90% of these isolates are in two clusters. Uh, you don't usually find uh, anything like them in gastroenteritis clusters, and there are no gastroenteritis isolates in the invasive part of the tree here. Okay. Now, they use something called BEAST, which is Bayesian MC-MC analysis of molecular sequences, and it's a chronometer that lets you know. And what you can note is that the, the, of the two clades, there's one cluster, cluster one, ar arose somewhere in the 
uh, the, the late 60s. And the other cluster arose apparently somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s. And moreover, the first cluster has totally disappeared currently and has been replaced by the second cluster. And that was associated with the acquisition of chloramphenicol resistance. So here is the, uh, the appearance of chloramphenicol resistance in Salmonella typhimurium in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And here is the displacement of clone one with clone two. And the basis for the resistance is the virulence plasmid with having insertions of antibiotic resistance genes. Now, virulence in Salmonella typhimurium is the plasmid is absolutely essential. So here, the selection has been put the antibiotic resistance in an essential part of pathogenicity and make sure that you're sustained, and it did. And so the two, the two clusters arose independently and they both had antibiotic resistance genes in their virulence plasmid, but the cluster two is one that got the chloramphenicol resistance gene, and somehow this gave the impetus, the selection for chloramphenicol, which is the treatment of choice for typhoid at the time. It led to the emergence and displacement of the preexisting clone. Okay. Now, using molecular, by, by sequencing all the different isolates, it's possible to know that cluster one began in Malawi around 1965 and spread uh, to uh, the Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Kenya over a period of time, but a fairly short distance. Once chloramphenicol was in there and resistance was, was spreading, also the appearance more of HIV, the second clade began to really spread throughout Africa and was the major cause of, of spread. And if you follow these, they follow major truck routes that are used for transportation and delivery throughout Africa. So, two. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are two independent clonal expansions. They came in two waves separated by 20 years, driven by chloramphenicol resistance, which was the first line of therapy. And it's temporarily associated with HIV. So the disease first arose in HIV-infected patients was found there. And it was very virulent. There was a 47% more inpatient mortality, 77% were dead at a year. There was a recurrent rate, and it was recrudescence and not reinfection. So you couldn't get rid of it, and they died. But this was in AIDS patients. It was not foodborne. In the early uh, times, they began to treat children with cotrimoxazole prophylaxis against uh, parasitic disease. But at the same time, of course, it's an antibiotic. And this was given globally to kids with HIV. And the disease had been seen in HIV-infected children, but not in non-HIV-infected children. But one of the impacts of using cotrimoxazole uh, prophylaxis broadly was now the appearance of the disease in kids. And it is a bad disease. Uh, you can see, and a third of them have malaria. Uh, many are malnourished. The, you didn't find it in food disease or gastroenteritis. You found it in blood culture. And of course, they were multi-resistant. This was considered kind of a paradox at the time. But th so it went from HIV to non-HIV, and it's now established in the pediatric community. And it's not foodborne, and all the data now indicate it is spread from human to human and not by food. This is not the way typhimurium is supposed to behave. I spent 30 minutes telling you one is gastroenteritis, and not host adopted, and the other one is host adapted. So what do you do under those circumstances is you sequence the sucker, and that's what Rob Kingsley did. And when you do it, I'll just give you the bottom line. The bottom line is that the organism shows, compared to ordinary food poisoning, uh, Salmonella typhimurium, the, lab, the classic lab strain of Salmonella typhimurium, has 23 pseudogenes, 20 deletions, and 60% of the genes are just the same kind of thing you see in what we know as the adaptation from Salmonella to go to 
the host adapted human strains of Salmonella paratyphi and Salmonella typhi. So in, in short, in 20 years, we have unwittingly followed the evolution of Salmonella typhi murium to essentially a typhoid like bacillus. Under the selection of humans having a disease that makes them very susceptible, the, the use of, of antibiotics, some for good reason and some not so good reasons, and it's ended up with this, this evolution in action and a new thing. So, now is there a host part to this? And I want to just do this briefly. There could be host aspects, and there's one that I find particularly fascinating uh, because it also impacts malaria as well as uh, salmonella disease, and that is about 100,000 years ago, uh, with the migration of a a Africa, there is a caspase called caspase-12 whose job really is to regulate uh, the, the inflammatory caspases in NF kappa B. And what happened is that dampens the response to infection. And what happened 100,000 years ago is there was a mutation that occurred, and uh, the mutation inactivated caspase-12 activity at least one arm of caspase-12 activity. And therefore, associated with that was now better resistance to septic disease and better resistance to, to malaria. And uh, however, for reasons known best to nature, about one in four to one in three sub-Saharan Africans still have, if you will, the wild-type gene which does have a dampening effect, and they're much more susceptible to sepsis. So it may well be that the reason that there's a high death rate from sepsis in the children in Africa may be because they carry this gene. That's a hypothesis uh, that I've put forth and is being tested. And it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong as much as at least we test it and get some idea of this thing. And I'll skip that. Uh, there are just a so caspase 12 also dampens the immune response to malaria. And so the idea of having a mutation in the caspase 12 gene means that the host can respond better to uh, the disease and control it. In the absence, if the wild type gene is there where it dampens the response, you're much more likely to get cerebral malaria than not. And uh, if you, uh, and this is an interesting aspect. Let me see. No, I want to go here. What is in, uh, just as an aside and test again testable? Uh, you, if you have somebody who has a active caspase 12, that is one that dampens the inflammatory response and therefore makes you much more susceptible to sepsis. If you give them something like progesterone, uh, you can basically make them appear to be not to have that caspase 12 regulatory effect. And when you do that, they become more resistant to sepsis. So it might be possible to test this to give children progesterone when they, it's the same way we sometimes give kids uh, dexamethasone for meningitis and have a beneficial effect on infection. Again, that's part of a hypothesis. That can be seen. This was uh, one that was done for malaria by Maya Sela at, uh, from McGill. She's done the work. Uh, whoops. I, so I knew that there would be a, life becomes kind of an Alzheimer's test after a while <laughs> for you. OK. One more. And then I'm just about there. So th this paper just appeared. I'm sorry to wait. But it, I have five minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done in less than a minute. OK. So malaria impairs resistance to salmonella through heme and heme oxygenase-dependent dysfunctional granulocyte mobilization. This just appeared. And uh, so it may, so the fact is that if you have malaria, you're much more susceptible to having typhoid. And that may also be involved in the high death rate since a third of the kids have malaria who have this disease. So reduce malaria, <laughs> and we will be successful in, in protecting against salmonella in part. We'll see. We're going to hear about a vaccine today that's very exciting. So these are all the idea that you can't just look at this as being something that antibiotics did and HIV did to the host, but there are host factors that are underlying this complex evolution that's occurred. So 
So uh, I don't do much research anymore. I'm a visiting investigator at the Sanger uh, Genome Institute, and I work with Rob Kingsley and some uh, Gordon Dugan and some very talented people from, from Africa. And I don't have her picture, alas, but Chineri Okoro is the one who did a great, great she's a PhD student working with Rob Kingsley, did a good deal of the work that I'm describing today. I had nothing to do with it other than being a cheerleader uh, and, that, and to report to you something that I hope you find interesting and relevant. Uh, I, I think it's very important to be, uh, to be totally uh, out, out front with people about any things that might be a conflict, and therefore, uh, I think I should tell you this. <laughs> so, now it's okay for me to say it, I'm 78, but there are some of you who are twisting uncomfortably in your chairs. <laughs> and then finally, I always end up talking with this. So, thank you. Stan, I want to compliment you on your nice jacket, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> My wife picked it out. She dressed me as usual. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Steve, but we need to get the microphone for that. Oh. That, that was a wonderful talk. Um, as, as I'm sure you well know, uh, in, in, it, at times in areas of the world where there's a, a very high incidence of typhoid fever, Indonesia, India, Nigeria, one sees a certain percentage of the population developing what we've termed severe typhoid fever or typhoid with uh, typhoid encephalopathy or yeah. typhoid with delirium. And that group of individuals, independent of having shock, toxicity, have a mortality which can be as high as 50 percent. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are as to whether that represents a different organism or a host or host factors and uh, yeah what do you think is responsible for that pathogen so I, I, it is unlikely it's due to the organism because typhoid has changed very little genetically uh, I mean it, it has it has certain qualities it, so it's it's vir virtually clonal around the world and the only major differences have been in antibiotic resistance so I would submit that what you're seeing is a difference in host response that uh, that is more important rather than the organism having different virulence. There, there is, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of kind of magical things that we don't know yet that the host really does. I've, it, we've always been fond of medicine of saying that the host is the one who causes the disease, not the organism, and I think that's true in this case as well. Okay. Um, I have a question if, anyway. Um, We've always, you know, with, with Yersinia pestis also, you have all those pseudogenes. That, and I, my question, I, 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 the question I have is, as you evolve into typhi or in this new strain of typhimurium, the appearance of all the, the loss of all this gene function, is, is the loss of specific genes associated with moving into this new niche, or is it simply that since they're in this new niche, they're able to lose certain gene function. Yeah, so I, uh, let me begin by saying, I always thought that host adaptation was going to be getting specifically new genes that came, and I was dead wrong, and that's why none of the goddamn experiments worked. But, <laughs> but it is very clear now, looking at the pathogen stuff, that there is gene loss, and it is not random gene loss or the decay in the genome. It is selective deletion of some type. So one of the first things Salmonella gets rid of when they start to adapt to another host other than a bird or cold blood is to get rid of the things that they use to survive an egg yolk, which is where they, they like to be secreted. There are selective genes that are lost over the time. And it's not just in Salmonella. One sees this in Bordetella. You see it in Yersinia. You see it in, actually in going in Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which likely came from Mycobacterium marinum or an aquatic source or had at least a common ancestor. And bovis, which everyone blamed as being the precursor <laughs> for, for humans, actually humans, it appears, gave it to the cattle. And you see loss of genes in there as well. So I, I think that, that it is a strategy that you come fully prepared to occupy a niche, and then over time you adapt to a particular host. 
that's what I think, but period. <laughs>